based programmes. Thank, Thank you. you. And Holly Kearns. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, for coming into the committee today. I think we're a really dedicated committee and we're really working to try and make a difference. You know, we open your committees formed and reports published and all of these things in, in relation to disability. And I think so often the rhetoric is kind of, you know, support and progress and numbers and funding, but then the kind of the reality of disability services in Ireland, you know, the, the, the reports say things like wasted lives. So the rhetoric can be quite different to the reality. And we hear a lot from um, all the different communities on this committee. And it is really harrowing every week um, leaving this committee, hearing the reality of what people are going through. And I think you probably know as well as all of the public representatives, one of the things that we get the most from our, our own constituencies is families who are really struggling to get, it could be SNA um, in their school, a, a space in a special class, even you know access to a special school, for example, in Cork Southwest. There is no special school, so people are traveling to the city. That could be two, two and a half hours, depending where you are. There's so, so many examples of this. Um, but ultimately, for us to be able to actually affect changes, we need ministers to come in, and we don't always um, get such a positive response. So I just want to say thank you very, very much for coming into the committee. Um, and I realise that the issues around special education are a lot longer in the making than how, how long you've been minister for. Um, but in your opening statement, you mentioned that people with disabilities in Ireland have an equal right of access to education under the law and that the department's policies to ensure that all children with special education needs can be provided with an education appropriate to their needs. And I think you and the department have to realise that those statements are infuriating to hear from families who literally can't get that education for their child that they, like you say, have a right to and so desperately need. Um, I have a few different things that I want to address, but I'm going to start by just addressing an issue that you're probably aware of, Minister. It was in relation to um, the early intervention class in a primary school in Cork South West in Kilbritton, and um, it came to the real surprise of the principal in Kilbritton and the, the parents and the students that the, the NCSE informed them the class was to close. And fair play to the community that they really rallied together and um, thankfully that decision has been reversed and, you know, just on the outset to say that is really, really good and welcome news and we were all delighted to hear that. Um, I suppose what is of still of huge concern is that um, the NCSE informed the CNO there that it was the national policy to wind down early intervention classes to phase them out in favour of the access and inclusion model. And I think we all know in this committee and you, you would know as well that that would be an absolute disaster. It's really, they're not the same thing. Um, early intervention classes are really crucial for so many people. We really, really need them and what we'd like to see is more of them. And, um, you know, I was hoping there was a miscommunication or, or some kind of misunderstanding there. But when the National Council for Special Education were in the committee last week and they were asked about this um, by our chair, Deputy Moynihan, instead of saying, which I think we all would have hoped they'd say, absolutely not, no way, we wouldn't dream of phasing out early intervention classes in favour of access and inclusion model. Um, they their response was quite worrying and it was very evasive. They said that they didn't want to comment and that they were waiting on the findings of the Access and Inclusion Model report. So of course that would lead us to believe that that, that is something that the department is looking at or worst case scenario has already sort of decided that it's doing, that they're prejudging the findings of that report and have started the process of potentially closing down early intervention classes because since raising the issue a lot around Kilbritton, I've heard from other schools where they've been in a situation where um, the NCSE is, is trying to, to close their class and in many cases they haven't managed to, to keep them open. And I know the response that we constantly got from the NCSE throughout this was, um, you know, it's based on need in an area and um, it was already agreed with the school that it would be closed. Like none of that is actually accurate because in Kilbritton as an example, to use this example, they had the staff in place for the following year, they had accommodation in place and they had students enrolled. So that is testament to the need in the area. So it is beyond me how that class could have been told they were closing. And what I really want to know or want from you is assurance that there is no plan or, you know, we're not even waiting on a report to see if there's a possibility of closing or phasing out our early intervention classes in favour of the access and inclusion model. And if there's time to have more questions, come in afterwards. Okay. Okay, thanks. Holly. Minister. 
Uh, thank you, um, Deputy. And yes, um, I, I was surprised myself when this th this transpired, um, and um, obviously other deputies contacted me in relation to it as well. Um, I, I just want to be clear that the national policy isn't to phase out um, at all. I, I can tell you that from my own perspective. Um, it's rather sometimes they are, they are transformed into special classes for mainstream. Um, but I am committed to early intervention. Um, and, and we have more special classes now. We have 2018, 2,118, as I said uh, earlier on. Um, and you know, the, the NCSC generally sanctions the establishment of uh, a special class, including these um, ASD early intervention classes, where there is a need. Um, and you know, there's no change in the department's policy. So I, I can I can reassure you of that today, um, uh, Deputy. If that's of assistance to you. It is actually. It's good. That's very reassuring. Thank you. Um, I suppose just as a follow-up question on that one, I'm wondering: Is there um, plans to to open more of those classes based on the very obvious need? I think in lots of areas, and um, I think one of the things that I see a lot is transitions between education stages being a major issue. Um, so I really welcome the increase and credit you the increase of, in numbers of special classes in primary school, but that isn't translating into secondary schools. So what I'm seeing a lot of is that. You know, when people are finishing primary school, they're ringing around every secondary school, you know, within a, a, a radius of an hour and a half of a drive, and there's waiting lists to get into special classes in secondary schools. So I presume the department can do modelling in terms of if we know how, ma how many um, spaces we need in primary schools, of course, that's going to translate into this many in secondary schools. I'm wondering what is the work going on in relation to making sure there's a provision for that. Yeah. Um, and then also, you know, in relation to the special classes that we have, just a really specific issue. Of, I think we all have it. So many, so many national schools um, are in the country saying, for one, they don't have enough SNAs and, and stuff like that, and they want to cater for all the children in their community of a school who are, you know, uh, fundraising through the. Uh, their committee to, to pay for somebody to come in to help because otherwise they have to tell the children they can only really come in for a certain amount of hours and the school really, really don't want to do that. But one of the problems, and I think what we saw in West Cork particularly during the pandemic was a lot of people relocated to West Cork from the city because they were working remotely. And then there was an uptick in the numbers of schools. But for some reason, the SNA then stayed, the number of SNAs stayed in the school rather than where the students went to. So it could take another year then to get the number of SNAs needed in the school they'd now moved to. Um, I'll just leave that then for yeah. now and see if I have more time after. Um, just that, that, that piece about transition from primary to post-primary is obviously critical. Um, and, and you mentioned one of the challenges there actually is, is when people move, you know, and you're, and you're not aware of that um, in terms of getting a special class specifically. Um, if a family moves uh, all of a sudden, it can be difficult. But one of the things um, that the department have been doing over the last couple of years is making sure that we're more streamlined in our approach. I mean, it very much struck me um, and uh, you know, uh, uh, and others involved in this area is that there hadn't been, for a considerable period of time, a proper forward planning uh, sort of forecasting model. But now the, the building and planning unit shares its its information with the National Council for Special Education, so you can actually see where capacity is going to be needed into the future. Um, so there's sort of short term medium term and obviously long term planning um, that's going on uh, at a national and at a regional level and, and that's based primarily on population demographics um, but also the average percentage of school going population that are going to require uh, special class places because you know and I've said this publicly myself before I don't want to be in a situation where I'm back here in, in a year or a year's time still talking about the lack of, of, of special class places particularly during transition and time. So there will always be, unfortunately, you know, cases where one falls through the cracks because of, of you know, different, you know, perhaps a different uh, change, perhaps moving from a special class to a special school or mainstream to a special class or indeed changing address um, or, you know, different things like that. But in the main, the majority, we should be able to anticipate in advance. Um, and. You know, we've seen the growth of autism, for example. It's, it's grown exponentially in Ireland and uh, internationally as well. And we have to cater for that. Most of our special classes are, 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 are for autism. Um, and so that's something that we're very aware of. Um, so 
you know, we, 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 the main thing is that we have the structures in place the way that we do for other mainstream schools that aren't, uh, you know, for children with additional needs. They can do it for that, for those, that type of school. They, we can certainly do it in the area of special education. Just in terms of SNAs, I mean, it's always open to a school to apply for an exception review um, if they require an additional SNA. Um, there's obviously the, the front-loaded allocation now, and over the next number of weeks, we'll, we'll know uh, better, and schools will be able to to know exactly how many SNAs they will have for, for next term, um, which which would be important. Um, and I think it's important to say as well that in mainstream, you know, a child doesn't need a diagnosis to to access an SNA. Um, but we have an unprecedented amount. I mean, since 2011. We've increased the amount of SNAs by 81%, which is which is really, you know, quite considerable. Um, but there's always a, a demand, um, and you know we have to try and ensure that we have sufficient coming on stream and sufficient training uh, for the SNAs, and that schools have the requisite um, amount that they need. As I said, they can apply for an exception review, and I think something like over 50% of all uh, exception review applications were um, were actually. Um, um, that they received uh, an, an additional SNA or, or part of an SNA um, when they actually applied. Just on that, I suppose if 50% if of people who seek that review actually then get the SNA, I think it would show that there's an overly restrictive approach being taken by the department. And when schools are actually tied up with so much of their time trying to get the SNAs and to mm -hmm. get the classes, that really takes away from the time they're trying to spend with students. And it's actually you know, what I hear from principals and stuff, it is a huge pressure. And I think that we need to look at that system because if 50% of the appeals are getting them, something's not right. And in addition to that, a lot of people who are appealing are not getting them. And it's very clear to everybody that it, that it is desperately needed. Yeah. Um, and one other thing, Minister, because this is really, and in the context of, and, and Pauline touched on it, and it's not in your department, is the um, Progress in Disability Services and the Children's Disability Network team. So when you take the context of what families are dealing with already, that's not even getting the first kind of interaction you get with the Children's Disability Network team, being on a waiting list for months to even get initial assessment to get early interventions like speech and language therapy, physiotherapy, occupational therapy, all of these really crucial services that should be there for people, that they shouldn't be fighting for, but trust me, most people are, yeah. and they're not even getting the first point of contact with them. And then they can't um, get a, a, space, a space in a special class, or they can't get a space in an early intervention unit, or in access and inclusion.